Hello and welcome to WeatherSnap, your weekly weather and climate headlines from the Met Office. It's Friday the 27th of January and I'm Claire Nazir. And I'm Alex Deakin. Now, Alex, last week we touched on the stratospheric polar vortex and this week we're nodding to the fern effect. Um, yeah, you know, last few days we've been blighted by fog and frost and low temperatures in the south, but something exceptional happened on Tuesday in Scotland. Yeah, remarkable week of weather, really, with much colder conditions across the south, much milder air arrived further north, and it never quite pushed down to the south. And as well as that milder air, temperatures were topped up further by the fern effect, a nifty mechanism where air that's loaded with moisture flows over the mountains, drops out that moisture in the form of cloud and rain and it cools obviously as it goes up but as it comes down the other side of the mountain it descends and as it descends it warms up the descending air warms up faster and you've also got the sunshine now as well so temperatures tend to jump up on the lee side of the mountain and that is the fern effect and that's why we saw that 15.8 celsius at Dice Airport in Aberdeenshire, while some parts of central England and east Wales were struggling in the fog at close to zero Celsius. Remarkable. Yes, on that day, Hereford saw a temperature of 0. I think it was 8 degrees Celsius. That's a huge difference in temperature across probably about 800 miles, not a lot really. And we're going to be talking about diverse or varied temperatures on another planet in a moment which is exciting stuff, particularly for Alex, because obviously he studied astrophysics as his degree. (laughs) News to me, because I haven't read the script. (laughs) (laughs) But that's that will be good. I'd love to tap into his, uh, you know, font of information insights on that. But what else has been going on this week across the world in terms of weather? Well, we've been keeping a keen eye on tropical cyclone Chaniso. Torrential rain will continue to affect parts of Madagascar over the next few days. Nearly 300 millimetres are expected as that system continues to drift quite slowly across the western side of the island. So, yes, pretty horrible conditions there. At this time of year, yes, they do get a lot of cyclones, but they seem to get more than their fair share. It wasn't... I think we were talking about this just recently, that there was one across the Mozambique Channel and yet another one is here and producing impacts. What else is happening, Alex? Quite slow moving that storm as well. That's one of the things about it. It just hasn't really fizzled out. 300 millimetres of rain, put that into context, is about half the annual rainfall that that parts of East Anglia get. So half a year's worth of rain falling in the next day or so from that tropical system there. Um, What else are we talking about? We're talking about unsettled weather across the Mediterranean as well. We've had high pressure across the northwest of Europe, helping us to see the foggy and frosty conditions in the south. When you get that, it usually means there's at least an arm of the jet stream slipping further south and generating low pressures across the Mediterranean. And that's what we've seen this week. Lots of wet and windy weather. And one that was named actually by the French, uh, Storm Hanalor. So the French, in conjunction with Spain and Portugal, they have their own naming system. And as uh, our colleague Aidan pointed out this week, really interesting that they're already up to H in their storm system and we haven't even had an A yet. So it just goes to show that weather pattern that's been stuck across Europe for much of um, the autumn and the winter with the, the jet stream slightly south shifted. So yeah, lots of wet and windy weather across France and Spain, but now across central parts of the Mediterranean and moving towards uh, Greece and Turkey as well. We're going to see further very heavy rain, a lot of cold air on its northern flank as well. So that's uh, more good news for the uh, for the Alps in terms of skiing and in terms of fresh dumps of snow likely here and also across parts of Romania perhaps, but snow falling above about 1,000 metres and uh, 200 metres in northern parts. So um, snow over Romania likely at low levels with some large accumulations higher up. Now in a moment we'll be talking about the weather on Mars. But before that, I caught up with Graham Madge, our climate correspondent, earlier today to discuss how La Nina, yet again, has impacted our not only our weather, but also our ecosystems this year in terms of the absorption of carbon dioxide in tropical forests. Here he is. Graham, we've talked about La Nina a lot on WeatherSnap over the last year or so, really, because it's been dominant across the globe impacts across many areas of the world. And now we look to La Nina and what's going on with our global CO2 emissions. 
That's right, Claire. Particularly, we're intrigued by the effect that it has on the amount of carbon dioxide emissions which add to the total in the atmosphere. You'll be familiar that we've got this measurement that's been going on at Mauna Loa since 1958 in Hawaii, where very accurate measurements have been taken year on year. And we can see that that trend has been increasing. So the amount of carbon dioxide that's present in the atmosphere at that site has been building year on year. But some years it builds more than others. And what our researchers have been working on and forecasting is the fact that because we have a La Nina, it means that tropical forestry is able to take up more of the carbon. So although the emissions coming out this year are high, a greater proportion of those emissions are being soaked up and drawn down by tropical forests because they have the right conditions to enable them to do that. And that is the opposite of what we would expect in an El Nino year, when the Pacific Ocean releases more heat to the atmosphere, that has the effect of drying forests out, hampering their capacity to draw down. So we have this dividend at the moment from nature, where it is helping us soak up some of these emissions but we can't rely on nature forever. And if La Nina goes, which the forecast suggests it will this year, then that will mean that we have more emissions landing up in the atmosphere. And it also means, of course, that because La Nina helps to cool the planet fractionally, we'll lose that dividend as well. So the message from this is absolutely clear that by the 2030s, we need to be bringing down the addition of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere to zero. That's what the climate science is very clear on if we want to stay below or at 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. So at the moment, we're seeing around two parts per million of carbon dioxide added to the atmosphere annually. And what the science is telling us is that within another seven years or so, we need to see that come down to zero. And at the moment, that is a huge challenge. Huge steps have been made, but there's still many more steps on that road. And talking about huge steps in climate science, let's talk about the communication of climate science and climate stripes, which have been really um, a great way of representing where we were and where we're up to currently. Um, And now Reading Football Club are likely to don those stripes for a football match. Isn't it fantastic that these um, symbols of climate change are being incorporated in football games where, you know, fans get to see their team actually playing in a kit that has these uh, stripes emblazoned on them. It's a great talking point and is a reminder, I think, to everybody that, you know, climate change is affecting everybody and we all have a role to play. And I hope it prompts great discussion. My thanks to Graham Madge for that report. Interestingly, Alex, even last year on the Reading Football Club homepage, they had the stripes, they had the climate stripes saying, show your stripes. I think it's really brilliant that they're doing that. It really is great that these kits that Reading will be wearing on Saturday, you know, there'll be a global audience. They're playing Manchester United, one of the biggest teams on the planet. It's free to air uh, TV on ITV on Saturday. So it's it's going to be great exposure for the stripes. And it's just Brilliant. Hopefully, it'll, you know, get people get people talking. And, you know, if you think about the the hues of blue to red, it almost it's so many different kits, isn't it? All in one. It and does work with a stripe. That's yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, it does work with a lot of kits. Uh, I'm sure Norwich would probably disagree because they play in yellow and green. And Plymouth. And Watford course, Football in, Club. Yeah. And yeah, and Watford as well. But, you know, Sheffield Wednesday, you know, uh, West Brom, have I lost you? West Brom, they're all, yeah, there's a lot of football kits in there with the red and white stripes as well. You've got, you know, Sunderland, that kind of thing. But yeah, you're, you're right. There is a, there's definitely an association there with the stripes uh, and football. Is um is Reading have got any red or blue in their actual kit? Do you know? Yeah, the kit is blue and white stripes generally. <laughs> okay. and it's, and so that's good. Always good to know. Okay, right. Let's move swiftly on from that to it's the closest planet to us. It's Mars and Perseverance, which is the Mars rover, 
has filed its first detailed weather report. The top line, Mars, is turbulent but also varied when it comes to weather conditions. Now, Perseverance rover landing site is the Jezero crater and it's been monitoring conditions for quite some time. Incredibly, it has over 250 sensors internally and externally across it, which means it can pick up so many different parameters. Alex, first of all, because you are the guy who studied astrophysics, how does Earth's weather compare to Mars's weather in terms of temperature, etc.? Well, water makes a big difference, doesn't it? And that's you know one of the issues we have with Venus. Greenhouse. The runaway greenhouse yeah. effect mm. on, on Venus creates huge temperatures there because of uh, the greenhouse gases involved. Mars doesn't have any water, of course, uh, which makes a massive difference. The Earth's average temperature is 14 degrees Celsius, but the average temperature on Mars is a chilly minus 63 degrees Celsius. Now, that is in part because it is further away, but it's in part also because we have more of an atmosphere because of the, the water content and because of the natural greenhouse gases you know we we have greenhouse gases on earth naturally and they help to keep the temperature around 37 degrees i think above what it would be if we didn't have them so we do have to have some uh, greenhouse gases but it's the putting more of them that's that's altering the the balance with that and of course yeah mars doesn't have the moisture it doesn't have the water in the atmosphere so minus 63 so quite a contrast there with it with the two temperatures between earth and mars and interestingly, actually, Perseverance has been measuring average air temperature across this crater. And the average is around minus 55 degrees. But day or night, it can vary as much as 50 to 60 degrees. And that's a proper diurnal range if ever I've spoken about one. Yeah, we'd be excited with a 20 degree diurnal range range in the UK, but 50 or 60 degrees. Yeah, that's that's next level, isn't it? That's incredible mm. change. And actually, you know, Martian days are only about 40 minutes longer than the Earth's day. So it's not like they're getting just really long nights and then longer days. But it's uh, it's to do again with with the atmosphere and the dynamical conditions with on on the red planet. Mm, interesting. Now, before we go, let's go over to Ollie Clayton with last week's highs and lows. Here are the UK observation records from week beginning Monday the 16th of January. The warmest day of last week was Sunday the 22nd when Acnegar in Ross and Cromarty peaked at 10.9 Celsius. Frosty weather was once again a feature with many sites recording sub-zero temperatures. The coldest place was Drumdrocket Inverness with a low of minus 10.4 Celsius in the early hours of Thursday. The wettest place was Jersey Airport where 47.2 millimetres of rain fell on Tuesday. The sunniest spots last week were Tippenham Airfield and Weybourne in Norfolk, where eight hours of sunshine was recorded. Alex, it's a pleasure having your company. Thanks very much. That's all from us from Weathersnap. Editor is Adrian Holloway, and we'll be back next week. Weathersnap is a podcast by the UK Met Office. For the latest weather conditions where you are, download the Met Office weather app.